Big Buck Registries, Big Buck Podcast, episode number 54. Greg Ritz, Huntmasters. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. This is Jana Waller from Skullbound TV, and you're listening to my favorite podcast on Stitcher, the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. Welcome to the show. This is Jay Scott, your host of the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. Back again to uh, do another episode, another amazing guest today. But first, I'd like to tell you that I've got Dusty Phillips, our field correspondent from Ohio, on the other line from Chubby Tines Outdoors. Dusty, what's happening? You know, I just got on cruising Facebook and, you know, checking out some things and, and checking out some awesome hunters that uh, I've been fortunate enough to be in contact with. And, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of things going on in the woods right now. A lot. You know, it's getting active. There, you know, you got fawns running around. You got velvet antlers running around. You got trespassers running around. You're seeing everything <laughs> right now on on trail cam. You know, yeah, everybody's got their trail cams out, and uh, you know, there's just a lot going on in the woods. And I'm liking everybody's post. You know, and we we definitely enjoy it at the Big Buck Registry to to see the fawns and the, to see the, the the nice bucks that are up and comers. And you know, it's just that, I'm enjoying that right now. Yep. What's going on with you, Jay? Yeah. Well, you know, I took a ride the other day in my car. It was about eleven o'clock. Took a back road to the next town over and. I don't know why, but I saw three fox and a big deer all around 11 o'clock during the day. Isn't that weird? Yeah, that is kind of weird. But, you know, they're saying that the the critters of the woods, you know, notice I said critters. I like that. I like that term. Yeah. They're starting to pick up on the human activity in the morning and in the evening. So they're moving throughout the, the midday. Yeah. I'm seeing it more here in Ohio than ever, you know. And that, that, you brought that up, and that just made me think that. You're right. I have seen a lot of activity around 11 o'clock. Yeah. Yeah, we're seeing uh, phenomenal crops here in Ohio. You know, the soybeans are thriving. The corn's, I say, knee high by the 4th of July. I think it's going to be like neck high by 4th of July. The rain's hit us just right. You know, they've side-dressed the corn here, and it's really, really taken off. So I'm expecting that once the crops come on, that uh, it's going to be a phenomenal year, and and the herds of deer are going to be eating well and have some potential to, uh, you know, have some big weights along with some nice antlers. That's awesome. I've heard good things about, uh, you know, we had the right amount of rain and the mass crops probably going to be pretty good. We've had plenty of rain this season, but we've had great weather too in between. So I'm looking forward to a great season. And I think the the ticks got knocked down pretty good because of the, the longer snow cover that we had here. So it's it's really developing into going to into a good deer season, and it's it's only – july technically right so. yeah i'm seeing a lot of pictures a lot of trail cam pictures with ticks on the deer's ears that, that, yeah yeah you know, that's that's a weird thing that they they get on the ears like that and i see something real interesting that uh somebody posted that this one doe in particular had rubbed her neck so much with her ears trying to get them ticks off that she had made a raw spot on her neck that, that was interesting you know that they mm go the extra mile trying to get them ticks off. And I know they bother them, but, uh, you know, it's, I'm seeing more ticks this year than I have in a while. Oh, is that right? So, sounds like New Hampshire that uh, the ticks are, you know, a lot of them has not come back because of the cold winter. I like, feel that way. My backyard for the last four or five years, I could time it where we'd be covered. And this year, it didn't happen. Yeah, I heard something. I'm going to say something. I heard something that you take dry ice, like a pound of dry ice, put it in a uh, container, like a Tupperware bowl, or yeah. uh, and cut some holes in the top, yeah. and just th- throw it out in your backyard, and the ticks will actually uh, come to that carbon monoxide and uh, possibility that you could get rid of several hundred ticks in your backyard. That's a great idea. Yeah, uh, something something to try. If you try it, let us know and give us a report on that. Yeah, I've seen that. I think Dr. Grant Woods, one of our our guests, uh, not too long ago, did that on an experiment on his his land down there, and it looked like it worked because it was covered. It was absolutely covered. Yeah, that's that's something interesting and you know something that you can try out. Yep, uh, Dusty, ever heard of Greg Ritz from Hunt Masters? <laughs> Uh, come on now, Jay. If you're a hunter, you know who Greg Ritz is. I know. I, should, I don't even need to ask the question, but I need to yeah. kind of prep the show. So 
people can understand where we're going with this. But yeah, Greg Greg Ritz is joining us tonight. No, I'm super excited, and Greg, thank you for you know taking the time out of your busy schedule to talk to us here at the Big Buck Registry. And you know, Jay, I think we need to prepare for some awesome, awesome, awesome tips and tricks in the Whitetail Woods tonight. Yep, Ritz's rules. That's how we describe it: trial and error, learning. You know, screwing up, basically making mistakes in the woods and just kind of making a mental notes of the rules that you play by. I think we all do it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I, I'm going to throw this out there. I'll guarantee you, and I think everybody that hunts is going to say this, I'll guarantee you that you're going to make huge mistakes in the whitetail woods. Oh, well, you know, you, you dust them off. And you learn from mistakes, and you better your hunting. Right. And that could just goes for life, too. I don't think I've ever done anything right until I did it wrong. Right. You know, and I think uh, we're going to see that uh, Greg Ritz learns from his mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. And he's going to tell us all the things he's learned about over the years. And then he surrounded himself through a new venture called Wildcom, where he is basically in tune with some of the best talent that's out there on TV and, and not, not on TV, just great hunters in general. And he talks to them and he learns from them. He studies them to apply it to his own thing. Kind of like, well, frankly, what we're doing here. We're studying other hunters through verbal interaction. Yeah, and, absolutely. And, you know, and he's been around. Thompson Center, you know. Been around for a long time in the yeah. hunting industry. So he knows lots and lots of people. And yeah, it seemed like I've seen something 17 years on the TV, you know, in the right. outdoor industry. That, that's phenomenal. It's a lot. It's a lot. And um, he's well connected and he knows a lot about hunting. We see Greg around, uh, you, you know, you follow him on Twitter, Facebook, and, and all the social media, and you're going to learn something from Greg just, you know, just by being connected with him on social media. Absolutely. Um, well, I, I don't really want to wait too much longer. I really like to want to talk to Greg. Let's get him on the phone. Absolutely. All right. Greg Ritz, welcome to the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. Thanks, guys. I appreciate being part of the podcast. Oh, uh, we're psyched to have you, man. It's quite an honor. Uh, you know, I was cruising through Twitter, and uh, I, you know, you sometimes you flick the screen once you get to the the Twitter account, and there, lo and behold, there's Greg Ritz from New Hampshire. And it's not very often I get to talk to another hunter from New Hampshire, so I was like, "This is the guy we got to have on the show, Dusty." Well, I appreciate the invitation, and uh, it was interesting, uh, you know, in the uh, you know the if you want to call it professional hunter community, you know, most of the guys are living in the Midwest and living down south. There aren't a lot of guys up here in the Northeast because the style of hunting up here, and of course the uh, the quantity of big deer is a lot different than the deer factory out, uh, say, in Ohio. Right, uh, easy now, you know, deer factory. Yeah, Deer Factory. Uh, deer Factory. Yeah. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> now, D Dusty, do you look down upon that when we say that about Ohio? You know, I, I don't, and I'm very fortunate to be where I'm at as far as the, the nice whitetails. You know, it's not about killing a giant every year. And, and if you do, though, it's very fortunate and it's an honor. But, you know, uh, I don't know if we call it a Deer Factory. <clears throat> no? Okay. Yeah, we just, we, we're just we fortunate that the crop fields are here. And, and you know, that that's not New Hampshire. Right. No. You know, it, it's, you know, it's agriculture in the Midwest that really creates the, you know, the phenomenal genetics and the deer density because there's just so much more for these deer to feed on. And, Jay, you know, living up here in New Hampshire, really in New England in general, you know, you drive down the highway, it's like a tunnel. Yeah, I mean, you right. got trees right to the side of the road. So you're hunting big timber whitetails, which entirely different strategy. You know, you, yep. we, we're not hunting over food plots and cut cornfields. You know, we're tracking deer and looking for uh, little white oak ridge tops. And, and it's, uh, it takes a lot more effort on the scale side of things to locate that mature buck. Right. But I do enjoy it. I mean, after years and years spent in the woods, I can't imagine it any other way. I mean, I just love it. I just love the way New Hampshire's set up. But then again, I haven't yeah. hunted a lot of other places, and that's why I have to live vicariously through others like yourself. Well, you know, one, one of the greatest things I like about New Hampshire, and, and you'll really uh, um, appreciate this, is, you know, you'll go walking a mile, you know, back in big timber and you're looking for a good place to set up, and then all of a sudden there's a stone wall. Right. It's just in the middle of the timber. Out of nowhere. And, you know, out of nowhere. And uh, obviously that stone wall, you know, represents an old homestead. 
in an area that originally was timbered and farmed, and those stones uh, were, were picked up out of the field and piled on the stone wall. And, of course, you know, generations uh, later, you know, when uh, nature reclaimed itself, now we have the big timber. But, uh, you know, it's uh, really steeped in history hunting up in this part of the world. It is. And, and when you find one of those old cellar holes, you got to be careful because, A, you could end up in the cellar hole and not get a way out. <laughs> but even worse, there might be an old well around. And that's yeah. those are dangerous. And actually, there are some big yeah. ones out there. Well, yeah. I, I, I got to tell you, you know, when I moved to New Hampshire, gosh, it was like 17 years ago when I moved up to work for Thompson Center Arms. I was just their national sales manager. You know, I was, in fact, um, funny enough, I was living in Ohio, of, of all things. Oh, no kidding. And, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. I was just north of Cincinnati in an area called Fairfield. And, uh, you know, it's it just a phenomenal big buck area. And I covered Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, and Kentucky as a sales rep. And I move up here. So, to me, whitetail hunting was, was different in Ohio. And coming up here, and, and uh, you start hanging out at the gun stores and talking to guys and going over to Kittery Trading Post. Yeah. And, uh, you know, guys are talking about, man, you know, rough year this year, I killed 164. And <laughs> look at the guy, I'm thinking, man, he, he must have a heck of a collection of trophies. Another guy going, yeah, well, you know, a pretty good year. I shot a 187, but not like super enthusiastic. And, and I go, really? And he goes, yeah, yeah, 1200. And I'm like, well, I know what that is. Turns out they're talking about weight, <laughs> right, <laughs> talking right. about inches of the antlers. <laughs> it, it is a different perspective based off of where you live in the United States. It really is. Yeah. Yep. What, um, what gets you out of bed in the morning, Greg? You know... Um, I'm motivated by a lot of things, and I think what drives me the most is trying to contribute in some form or fashion to this industry. You know, I've been blessed to make a great living in this industry, and I've worked with a manufacturer sales representative for some of the best lines in the country, Leupold and Remington and Magalite and Osler, and then I went and ran Thompson Center for uh, 12 years, and then I uh, was president of Smith & Wesson for a couple years on the long gun division, and I'm a relatively young guy, and I feel that I've got a um, an opportunity to create a legacy in this industry. And uh, yeah, my tenure at Thompson Center, uh, I can say that I helped introduce almost $5 million to this people to the sport of muzzleloading. And uh, then I ran uh, sport and archery for three years, and I helped create the legislation and introduce more people to the sport of bow hunting, you know, through the opportunities generated uh, through these new crossbow seasons. So, hmm. you know, now my focus is youth. Gotcha. Um, I've got three girls. They're 12, 10, and 8. All of them shoot vertical bows and crossbows and air rifles and 22s and I really feel compelled to try to utilize um, you know my family and my contacts and my passion for the industry to recruit more people to our sport awesome that's that's a great reason to get out of bed just uh, every day yeah, it, makes it easy well, you know it's it's great to give back and when when you guys know because you've been around uh, young people and you've been around just new people coming into the sport I had dinner last night with a couple friends of mine that I work out uh, at the local CrossFit gym at. Yep. And these guys are like new into bow hunting. And uh, one guy's never killed a deer with a bow, killed one deer with a, with a gun. But to hear their enthusiasm and their and their passion, just one night to just kind of share my stories and, and whatever I can do to, to enhance their experiences, I know they walked away. And if they can recruit one or two more people uh, to hunt with them, we're, that's the legacy to the sport. Absolutely. No question about it. What was it like growing up in Maryland? <laughs> You know, Maryland uh, is a really overlooked state from a, a, a resource standpoint. They have, you know, most people think of Maryland, you know, Baltimore, Maryland, um, certainly Under Armour is, is located down there, so people are familiar with Baltimore, but you also have Washington, D.C., so they think of you know, big city and congestion. Right. You get outside of those two areas, you have rural America, just like Ohio and the Midwest. You go down the eastern shore, it's a completely different demographic down there. And then you go western Maryland up in the mountains, up in Garrett County. Right. Not hunted at all growing up. And uh, it, it's just got a great, um, you know, natural resource uh, for people who like to hunt and fish. And guys, they've got some big bucks. They really right. do. Um, and, and I think people focus on the Midwest for big deer, but anymore, if you manage whitetails, there's there's probably not a state in this country that can't produce, you know, a giant deer. Right. Did you hunt a lot as a kid? You know, I, I killed my first deer when I was 12 with a bow. 
And uh, I got into I got into boat hunting when I was eleven. You know, I was a Boy Scout, so I mean, I shot sure. when I was young. And, and my next door neighbor kind of took me under under his wing. And of course, he was a former Marine, so you can imagine the <laughs> uh, what I went through. There wasn't wasn't anything done easy. You know, right. We had to make sure we walked over the next mountain. But I spent a lot of time um, hunting down the eastern shore of Maryland for second deer. Oh wow, that's different. And, Interesting. You know, a lot a lot of people don't um, really know what second deer are. Of course, you know the, these are or fair chase wild sick of deer. In 1922, um, they imported 22 uh, deer from Japan, sick of deer, and put them on James Island, and then they swam off the island. Huh. And, uh, you know, there's three counties, Dorchester being the biggest, that actually have a huntable population of sick of deer, and they are genetically related to elk. But they only weigh like 120 pounds live weight. They're a very small animal, yeah. and uh, they have a very European regal look. But they uh, they bugle, you know, like an elk. It's I a heard very that. fascinating animal. I heard, yeah. They we were speaking to an, uh, another uh, host or a, a guest, and they were telling us about the sick deer and how they end up bugling um, like an elk. And also, they are genetically related. That's very interesting. They they, they are they are and. You know, they're very nomadic. They, they don't make, you know, like hunting a whitetail. You know, if you can get a non-pressured whitetail or an early season or late season deer that's coming to food, you can pattern the deer, certainly with the use of trail cameras, right? Yeah. You can dial it in and, and know where to set up and hunt. That, that does not work for a sick deer. They are very nomadic. They live in the swamp and they're very, very difficult to kill. So that was a, that was a fun challenge and kind of a big world for me. You know, when you're in your teens growing up and you're hunting blackwater refuge and thousands of acres of swamp, you know, and uh, besides, you know, shooting sick of deer, we're shooting a lot of waterfowl at the same time. Right. Well, that must have been some great territory to, like, hone your skills as as a youth. It, 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 it was. And, uh, you know, and then, uh, you know, also growing up, I'd take 10 days to two weeks, and I would go to Virginia, and I would hunt uh, George Washington National Forest, which is a million acres of public land. So mm-hmm. I really grew up as a public land hunter. You know, across the street from where I lived was a reservoir, which is public land bow hunting, and then I go to George Washington National Forest, and we'd backpack in, and uh, awesome. you know, we would hunt the uh, the muzzleloader in the gun season because they were back to back. And uh, so I really cut my teeth on big mountain hunting, which is really what you deal with here in New Hampshire: big timber, big mountains, and you don't have the food plots and cornfields and all to kind of funnel the deer. You had to go find the uh, you know the briar thicket they were uh, bedding down in, or the White Oak Ridge top they were eating on. Gotcha. That's amazing. So you grew up in Maryland, and where did you go from there? Did you end up going to college, military? What'd you do? Yeah, so um, I went to college at Ohio Westland in okay. Columbus, Ohio. Oh, wow. Now, a lot of people say, well, how would you go from Maryland to Ohio? Well, uh, my dad grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. That's where he was born and raised. So, you know, I had family out there. And it was a great, you know, small liberal arts school. I had a wonderful experience there. Started a, a shooting team out there, which you know, mm-hmm. really fueled my passion for, for being a shotgunner, which, you know, led to, you know, two years working with a U.S. shooting team out of the uh, Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs. Hmm. But every week Weekend that I could, I went down to the family farm in Hillsboro, Ohio, which is you know Southwest Ohio, Neat. and uh, it was it was then that I would say I understood for the first time you know what a monster buck was. Right. Because prior to that, you know, I killed you know your sixes and your eights and probably every spike that will find me. Right. <laughs> and uh, right, yeah, I sure. didn't know deer management. You know, I just if it had horns on it or antlers, I shot it. And right. uh, then I started to understand you know because it was private land that if I passed deer and I left them to grow to a more mature level, there was a greater sense of accomplishment. That's something that every hunter needs to, that, that it's kind of like a, a, a tip or a point right there. I you, you mean, yeah. that management, 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 you know, you pass a good one and kill a great one. Just had to point well, that it, out. But. I know, and in, 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 in the, the story that really comes to mind, so the first deer I ever had mounted was about 140 inch deer taken off a family farm in Ohio. Uh, first Pope and Young Whitetail with a bow. And what was interesting is, you know, I, I found this deer. Um, and again, this is three trail cameras, right? So when I say found the deer, I saw him from the tree stand, found him, right? And then you would, you know, go to school, you know, back in you know, August and September, and you start looking at deer in velvet. And I really wish I had trail cameras back then. But, you know, I knew the deer was living on the property. And it took three years just kind of watching what this deer did. And, and I watched this deer grow from, you know, what I now know would be like a 110, 120 to 140. Two inch deer, you know, over the course of uh, a few years. And that was the first connection I had to an individual white cow, hunting one deer. And really, that's how our sport has evolved now, as opposed to random luck. With the aid of trail cameras and really sound game management, people now 
now are identifying deer, they're naming deer, they're invested in, you know, specific whitetails, and they wait till they hit that mature level before they harvest them. And that was my first experience, you know, back when I was a sophomore in college. That's a pretty good college experience to have a, a great <laughs> opportunity to hunt some big whitetails. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. Hey, mom and yeah. dad, I'm going to go off to college. See you later. Yep, yep. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, I graduated in four years and, uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, uh, was able to uh, graduate with honors, uh, but also put a couple big bucks on the wall in the meantime. Oh, man, what a great college experience. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so you, from Ohio, where did you go after college? The, uh, when I grew up, my dad was in the printing business. And, uh, so I was exposed to the graphic arts and printing world, you know, when I was a young kid. He'd take sure. me to work. And, and so I had exposure there. So when, uh, when I was graduating college, I had an opportunity to go work for Winchester Ammunition, uh, as one of their pro shooters and one of the guys who called on dealers and worked on ranges. And, you know, and I really was interested in that, especially as I could pursue my, uh, my Olympic shooting career. But when I really sat back and, course, with good counsel from my parents, you know, that's fun for a couple of years, but where is that going to lead you right. uh, later in life? You know, what kind of experience is that going to give you? And so, you know, I took their sound advice and um, I ended up going to Florida and working in the graphic arts and printing business because I didn't want to work in the same company as my father. Um, right. And I, so I used the, the skill I had growing up in my degree and I didn't know much. I worked third shift. I worked a graveyard shift. Oh, wow. So I worked no six, I, yeah, I worked 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., yeah. which wasn't, wasn't all that bad. You know, I get off at uh, at daybreak and I go uh, scuba diving off the beach and, and try to grab some lobsters. Sure. But, um, that yeah. lasted a, a couple of years until I could break into this industry. Gotcha. Now, what, what drove you to get into the industry from there? It sounds like you had some experiences growing up in college. And did you ever kind of have a in the back of your head that this is some place I need to be at some point? No question. No question. When I graduated college, it took me a while to figure out my role in, in that I could play in the industry and have fun and feel fulfilled and make some money. So I started off as a manufacturer sales representative, and it took me two years to get hired. And then there's a company out of Maryland called GB Stump Associates, it's still around today, and they had uh, Leupold and Magalite and Nosler. They had some big lines, hmm. but Remington Arms at that time decided to go to, to manufacturers or outside sales agencies, and they needed some dealer guys. And, uh, and I spent a couple of years developing content. And while I was in the printing business, just basically knocking on doors. And finally, uh, one of those doors opened up and George Stump owned the company said, you know, Greg, you stayed in touch for two years. We now have an opportunity. If you want to be a dealer guy and stock shelves with ammunition and work promotions and do basically the grunt work, he said, uh, you know, I can I can bring you on. And I said, great. So I started off in Pennsylvania. Then I got, you know, moved uh, from there to Ohio and my, um, you know, experience grew. But that really galvanized for me uh, the fact that I need needed to make a career in this industry because it was in my blood. Right, right. Pretty straightforward. So Maryland to Ohio to Florida to Pennsylvania back to Ohio. Mm -hmm. Wow. All, tra all trails led back to Ohio. Maybe, maybe it has something to do with big deer. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. That's awesome. Now, listening to some other podcasts that you've been on, I've I heard this term, and I need you to clarify it for me. Ritz's Rules. <laughs> Tell me about Ritz's Rules. <laughs> The, uh, that's, that's funny. So, <laughs> you know, I think I am the most creative mistake maker ever <laughs> born on this earth. <laughs> and, uh, and what I mean by that is I try not to make the same mistake twice, but I'm really creative on finding other ways to make errors. Gotcha. All and, right. uh, and through, and through that, from a, a white tail perspective, I try to reflect on every experience I have with a deer. I keep endless journals and notes on what are the weather patterns? You know, how did I understand? You know, when did I have certain sightings? It's getting a lot easier today, right? Because you have, um, you know, software right. companies like Hunt Force that right. can organize my trail camera photos and, and create a repository of information. But through that, I've developed some pretty specific ways that, that I like to hunt my girls. And, uh, you know, and, you know, number one rich rule is after three days hunting a stand, I don't care when it is, what it is, if things are good, even if the wind's good, I don't hunt the stand the fourth day. Uh -huh. And I, I have learned that, that pressure is is the most important factor on harvesting a mature whitetail. Gotcha. And so so many people, and you guys can relate to this, if they don't see a deer, they don't feel that they ever have polluted the area or affected or pressured the area, right? They just, I didn't see any deer, so obviously I didn't sure. see any deer. Yeah, that makes sense. But sure. anytime you walk in the woods, you imprint that woods with scent, noise, 
movement. There, you you are contaminating the area. And you know, I don't. I really, really work on. When I sit on the stand, I, I hunt to kill guys. Yep. That's what I do. Right. I, oh. I don't go on the stand blindly. I used to growing up, but I don't just. I don't just go out to say, oh, you know, maybe something will happen. I sit for a specific reason. Right. Gotcha. And uh, you know, so I just, I've learned over time to kind of create this rule book for myself on. You know, I never hunt about a wind. So if I'm in the stand, I can't tell you how many pop puddles I go through. Right. Checking the wind. Checking the wind. And if it starts to turn on me, strip it down and I'm out of there. Interesting. So you'll just stop. You'll just, nope, I'm out. Right there. Yep. Okay. I'll, I'll get down. It might be prime time. I'll have a cameraman look at me and go, really? Greg, we've been set up for an hour. Hmm. doesn't matter. If that, that mature deer knows we're hunting him and gets one nose full, we've blown it. Right. So it's so many. So what I try to do, and I don't know how uh, how you apply this, Jay, to, to hunt in New Hampshire. I know it's entirely different. Right. I find an area that I feel is in the core area of mature white town. And that core area expands during the rut and contracts early in late season, right? But it, it, it's his home base. He feels secure and there's a high level of activity, whether it's nighttime uh, or, or daytime doesn't matter. There's just an activity. Once I find that area, then what I do is I hang stands for all the various wind locations and the ability to come in and out of those stands from various locations so I don't continue to follow the same path in and out, in and out, in and out. And then what I do is I just I hunt that area um, day in and day out, but I just never try to repeat the same stand more than, than two or three days in a row. Gotcha. That seems like a good rule. That's yeah, awesome rule. Yeah. I, I've always felt that once you're in their habitat, you're now disturbing it, no matter how hard you try not to in some way, shape, or form. And I Well and, and, and you really have to think about how you do it. How many times we you know, we sit till dark or we sit till noon, and we okay, time to get down. What do we do? We lower our bow, lower our gun, sometimes we throw our pack down and we just walk out. Sure. Why do we sneak in and spray our boots and, and we try to be covert going in and we walk out like a herd of elephants? Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's so that's so me. Right. Man. That is so me. You know, yeah, I, because I know exactly we're tired, what you're we're about. hungry, right. we're disappointed, whatever. So I try to, to, whatever I do going in, I try to go out. I also try to go out a different way than I go in. Mm. Even if I just circle and go out of my way, I try not to, you know, double the contamination that I lay on the ground. Sure. Yeah, and Greg, that's, uh, you're sharing some awesome, some awesome information there. You know, a lot of people, a lot of hunters don't realize what it takes to become more successful on a mature whitetail. And, and these tips right here, are, are phenomenal for you know upping your success. Mm. Yeah, I like those you know, tips. I've hunted I've hunted animals all over the world in some pretty exotic, crazy locations, and I will put a white tail against any animal in the world as far as their ability to adapt pressure. Interesting, because you, I mean, you you have hunted all over the world. You've taken numerous types of species, so. That's interesting that you would say that. I didn't know that. And I've seen, and I've seen some crazy, I got to tell you guys a crazy story because I was over at Kittery Trading Post uh, this past weekend with Lee and Tiffany and we sure. all get swapping stories together and uh, we were just talking about how, how deer adapt pressure. So this is this was actually Ohio mm-hmm. and I uh, pulled up to a, to a farm I had access to and, and I was, it is a huge CRP field in front of me and then just to the left of me there was a fence line and then there started a, a cut corn field and that ended in some timber and, uh, and I knew the deer like to be in the, the CRP, and, and so what I tried to do was circle around the CRP and get back in the timber. But anyway, I didn't own the cornfield, or I didn't have rights on the cornfield, and I saw a guy sitting on the timber on the edge of this cornfield, I don't know, 300 yards away. He was already in the stand. I was I was running late uh, to where I wanted to hunt, and I'm getting all suited up, right? Keep all my clothes in rubber made containers, set, you know, set tight bags, and putting everything on, doing everything right. I look out, and a doe and two fawns hmm. pop up out of the CRP. So I'm watching them. You know, it, this was this was still kind of like mid October, so yeah. y- you know, the corn had been down for a few weeks, but you know, the rut hadn't kicked in. But I'm just kind of watching them. They want to spook them. You know, they're 200 yards, from them, right? Sure. So they're milling around the CRP, and they head over to the fence line. That to buy the CRP of the cornfield. Then they start walking down the fence line towards a hunter. And I'm like, oh, this ought to get interesting because this guy was kind of sitting in the corner. I'm like, well, if he's doe hunting, he's going to take this doe and I'm going to watch this. And I'm watching it. And these deer get to probably like 100 yards from this guy. He doesn't see him yet because they're on the CRP side of the fence line. Yeah. And then things kind of start to thin out as he gets in the timber. These deer, no kidding, get on their elbows. They commando crawl 75 or 100 yards down the fence line until they clear the guy. They stand up and they walk in the timber. Wow. 
and you got to see this all unfold from a distance. I got to see Holy this smokes. unfold. So these, so these deer knew this guy was in the stand. They adapted to him. They weren't spooked. They weren't nervous. They were just like, that's danger. When I get close to this, this is how I... So I'm sure that guy sat in the stand and never knew those deer were there. Right. They had a so plan. you got to wonder how many times did that happen to us? Of course. Yeah, for sure. Of course. Yes. Yeah, I mean, those deer had a plan from the, the minute they, they even sensed danger. That's right. And that hunter had no idea. No. He had, he, had, he had no idea. I had another uh, interesting story on, on pressure. I was hunting in Oklahoma, and uh, I was hunting a really good deer. It's like 160-inch, 10-point. My buddy and I were, like, teaming up on this. This was actually his father. He had invited me. And uh, so we had trail cameras out. This wasn't that long ago. And uh, we started to get daylight pictures because I won't hunt a mature whitetail until they're day walkers. Why well, go in there when they're just nocturnal activity? It doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. So anyway, he became a day walker. And uh, so we're like, okay, time to, um, you know, get involved, you know, time, time to, to dial this deer in and kill him. So uh, we set our stands up, go out early in the next morning, you know, pull up to the gate, open the gate, you know, walk on in, try to be stealth. Sit in our stands, nothing. Man, what the heck happened? Since the second day, nothing. So we're like, okay, let's not pressure it. Let's let the third day rest, and then we'll just slip in and get trail camera. Slip in the third day. So the first day, he came in the um, in the evening, in dark. Second day, he came in the dark. The third day, he came in the daylight. Hmm. Like, well, we didn't hunt the third day. So like, well, I wonder if we're, you know, bumping him going in. So we tried, you know, so we got to, you know, open the gate, went through the gate, and circle around. So anyway, this goes on for a week, and it was the same pattern. Whenever we didn't go in to hunt, he was in the day. Hmm. And um, so I'll fast forward to the more of the story. We... the we finally decide last day to hunt. What are we going to do? We got to do something different, right? Right, of course. So we, we pull up in the dark and we're like, okay, we're getting in super early at the time. Pull up, pull up the dark, get dressed, head over the gate. And just as my buddy was putting his hand on the gate, I said, stop. He goes, what? I said, don't open the gate. He goes, what do you mean don't open the gate? I said, you know what? For a week now, we've been opening that gate and that gate squeaks. He goes, you're crazy. So we're hunting 500 <laughs> yards away. I said, that doesn't mean the deer is 500 yards away. Right. He goes, okay. So we climb over the fence, don't open the gate, we kill the deer. Wow. That's awesome. Because of a squeaky so fence. That was because of a, that's right. That was alerting him to danger. So that was kind of his early warning sign. And, and the reason for telling the story, and I've done this in many seminars, is what do we all do that announces our presence to the deer prior to us getting to our stand? Right. That's, I mean, that's such a great message. I spent some time in northern New Hampshire in uh, March one year, uh, basically at a snowmobile hunting camp area, northern New Hampshire. Okay. And one of the things that I realized about deer when I was up there is that deer respond to change. And when I say that, it doesn't sound like much, but this is what I mean. We would be standing off of the deck at this deer camp slash snowmobile camp, snow on the ground, we're in the deep woods, and the deer are herded up in this area. And Mm -hmm. a lot of the the, the owner of the camp would feed the deer during the winter. He'd uh, go out. He had a, a basically just a piece of cardboard. He'd lay it down on the ground and he'd pour some corn on it. And he'd, he'd literally bang on the bucket and say, come here, come here. Here you go, girls. And all of a sudden they'd be coming around from yep. all over. Now, granted, their, their mannerisms might be a little different this time of year, but we could be standing near them just off the porch talking, just kind of chit chatting, not making any sudden move, but just doing our normal thing. They'd still come in within 70 yards of us to eat. The minute sure. that that we let the minute we stop talking, they get spooked and leave. Yep. If we moved inside while they were there, they get spooked and leave. If we were inside and came out and they were out, they get spooked and, and left. It's the same thing over and over. So I realized that simply changing your environment will change the way the the whitetail sees you, and it, it's very subtle. Something so basic. So it's not that they even care that you're there, but if you change that you're there, mm-hmm. now they're on to you. The uh, I tell you something that I've changed in the last couple of years that has made a, a difference of what I do. I, I own um, you know some ground in Ohio and uh, and I own some ground in Illinois and Iowa. And I used to always use electric vehicles to hunt. Mm-hmm. Gotta go still. Gotta go quiet. Right. Right. And um, I don't do that anymore. I right. just use I use my Yamaha Grizzly four wheeler to go run my cameras, and I don't wind it up or go fast. But what happened was I was spooking the so they wouldn't hear me coming. But if they ever saw me, they would turn inside out because I never announced my presence. Right. And so now you think of how much time you spend on a farm. You're running trail cameras. You're shed hunting. You know, I'm putting food plots in. I'm managing the tree stands. And, and this really dawned on me, and it was so obvious for all the years 
years I've hunted in Texas that the outfitters or guys would always use the same white pickup trucks that the farmers used for the guys running the oil rigs. And it finally dawned on me one day, why don't I just use my four-wheeler, you know, or my Yamaha utility vehicle day in and day out, year-round. So when I go to hunt, it's no different to them. Right. That they're used to the noise. I don't wind it up any louder. I don't run it any faster. And to your point, it's just routine. It's, it's like a deer living next to a highway, right? He's used to the cars going by. Now, all of a sudden, if cars don't go by, <laughs> he's going to go, well, what's going on? So it was just a way that I could condition my deer to the general activity on the property so when it came time to hunt it wasn't all that different right that's a great lesson yeah conditioning 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 well it's just it's like it's, it's how many how many of these uh guides you know bear guides like Saskatchewan Alberta you know see them in Maine too right or even the answer they bang the bait barrel right after they put the bait in there right and then the bears get used to you know the noise of the four-wheeler coming in the bait barrel being banged you know some of these guys go so far as to spray insect repellent around so that way when the hunters hunt and insect repellent, you know, they, they don't feel that's a, mm-hmm. um, you know, a foreign scent to them, and it works. Right. And the the whitetail is so adapt to all that stuff. They You can condition them, but you can also go against you, like you talked about with the buck, the squeaky fence. Yep. That will condition yep. them as well. So I guess you just got to okay. know what you're dealing with. Yep. I was talking to a guy over at Kittery this weekend. And this is a very successful bow hunter. And uh, his, last year, he killed a double drop time buck. Mm. Think about that for Maine. Double drop time buck. Right. That doesn't happen very often. No, that's, per, that's a rare and, occurrence. And this was, this was like a solid 140, 145 type deer, too. Mature deer. Okay. And, um, and this is by, you know, anyway, by an, I, antler d- description, right. not weight. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just wanted to and, specify uh, that. <laughs> you know, so I, so I asked him, you know, you know, how did he kill this deer? I'm always interested in what people do. And he said, Greg, he said, be honest with you, I never thought I'd get the opportunity opportunity on this deer. And I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, he was so visible in the bachelor for early season. Everybody knew about this deer. I said, okay. And then he said, and the problem was, he said, where he was living, I had to access the property that adjoined it, but that wasn't where the deer was living. I said, well, did you kill it during the rut? He said, nope. I said, so how'd you get this opportunity? And he said, the guys who had access to the property over scouted the property. Mm. And when the season opened, the deer had already adjusted to them hanging tree stands and putting trail cameras and sitting out. And they, they were they were so excited about trying to find this deer. that this, Again, this is before the season opened, that they had pressured the deer and the deer just shifted 500 yards on another piece of property, created an opportunity for him. Hmm. Interesting. How did he, de- how did he decide that? That was what had unfolded. Was he watching the the activities on the other piece kind of thing, or how did he no, realize trail that? trail cameras. All trick. Okay. Yep. Interesting. And, and I tell you, trail cameras guys are a blessing and a curse. Right. They give you hope. They give you information. <laughs> right. But first of all, they're not predictive. Right. Right. They just tell you what happened. Right. They only tell you what happened in front of you. Right. Right. So if a deer walks 10 feet to the right of the camera, guess what? You didn't get a picture of them. Yep. So a lot of times, if people don't see deer activity on the cameras or don't see the shooter buck, right? Right. Then they get discouraged. So, and sometimes people get so addicted to running the cameras every two or three days. Oh, I gotta go check my camera. Like, when did you put it out? Three days ago. Really? That's a big So, that's note. like a lobsterman dropping his pots and then running them an hour later. Right. You gotta let your cameras soak and you run them in a trap line, you run them in different sequences, but you, you cannot overrun your cameras. And you gotta put them in, in areas that you can get in and you can out, get out with not bugging the animals. And if you can drive up to them on a four wheeler or you don't have to get off and put a lot of center on the ground and you can kind of contain your activities to the peripheral part of your property and not penetrate the center of it to spook those deer, you're so much better. But people nowadays, they, they just, their curiosity kills them. Mm, that is true. So these are all awesome and, tips. Yeah, and by the way, I learned that the hard way. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I think know? we all yeah. learn through our mistakes. I'm sure that yeah. uh, we've all been in, but that's, but it's, it's great to learn from others. And that's one of the points I want to touch on tonight is that you're a student of others. It seems mm-hmm. you're constantly learning from others. Where does that come from? That you, I think some people just, that's who they are. That's their DNA. Yeah. And, um, you know, if, if, if the only things I learned in life were those that I learned from my own experience, you know, we would be just recreating the wheel every year, right? right. So part of evolution is learning from others. And there's a, there, and, and not, and not just watching TV and professional hunters and, and reading books and all that's great, right? But there's any time that you can talk to somebody and you can glean, glean some little piece of information about, especially people who are really 
die hard and passionate. It doesn't matter whether we're talking hunting or snowmobiling or, you know, surfing for that matter, right? There's, there's, there's always an evolution in, in any sport or any activity, but learning from others, you amass all of that information and then you process that and go, what can I do that is going to positively affect the outcome of my activities? Right, right. And that's, you know, and, and I'm blessed to, to have friends like Lee Lakoski and Mark Drury and Jay Gregory and, you know, some of the best whitetail hunters out there, right? Yeah, and uh, and you you take all of their experience, all the time in the field, and we all sh- we all share notes with one another. You know, I was just on the phone with Donnie Candy Kiski the other day. Yep. you know, talking about what's going on and little nuggets of information. You know, that you can glean from these guys, or you know, you have a Greg Miller who's been doing this forty years and has written how many books? Right, and you know, and it, they, we all have a style about us. But the uh, the biggest thing is whatever you know, whatever you do, you have to adapt the next year. Not repeat it. Right. Yep. Very well said. Now, Greg, you were the CEO of Thompson Center, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? What was it like being a CEO of a major gun manufacturer? Big responsibility. Yeah. Um, you know, here, you know, I took on the leadership responsibility um, of Thompson Center and really the the industry of muzzleloading, the sport of muzzleloading. And I felt, uh, you know, a duty to uh, to the industry to help work on seasons, increase opportunities, simplify the sport, introduce as many people to, to the sport of muzzleloading as possible. Because the more days that we can spend in a field, the better. And I will tell you my biggest frustration in this industry, and I, and I don't how to get over this, guys. I really don't. Okay. Bow hunters fight gun hunters. Gun hunters fight muzzleloader hunters. Muzzleloader hunters fight gun hunters. We tend to be a very selfish group of sportsmen mm. that we want everything for ourselves, right? So you get diehard bow hunters. Oh, yeah, man, there's gun hunters. All they do is just shoot all the deer out there. And then the gun hunters say, oh, you know, those bow hunters, all they do is jack deer up and you know, wound them and they never recover them. And at the end of the day, we're all sportsmen. We're all trying to work for the same renewable resource and for the continued right to do what we want to do. Right. So if it's legal and it's ethical, you know, let people make the decision. If a guy wants to shoot a longbow, absolutely. If a guy wants to shoot a flintlock, go at it. If a guy wants to shoot an AR-15 that's, you know, we're not really like an AR-10, you know, something that, that's, sure. uh, you know, kind of these assault deer hunting rifles, who cares? Right. Right. And, yeah. you know, that's his individual choice. And, and I really really hoping because now that I've been with Thompson Center on the gun side and Horton on the archery side and the sponsors that I have, I'm trying to find ways that we can we can rally around the bigger causes and not try to uh, to just worry about our own opportunities. Right. I mean, we're, we're all on the same team at the end of the day. There, mm-hmm. There's a much larger fight to fight if we can all just band together out there. So, That's right. And, and, and divided, we will fail. Absolutely. There's no question. Yeah, agree to that. Yep. Now, Greg, if you had to pick one, and this is a trick question probably in some shape or form, would you rather hunt with a gun or a bow? <laughs> I'm going to answer this, and, and I think I'm going to shock you. So, okay. obviously, the question is: is you know, basically, what would be my weapon of choice if I could just pick one? Yes, you can only pick right. one. Yep, a crossbow. A crossbow. A crossbow. Well, that's a good answer. And, my goodness. And, and the reason <laughs> the reason is I enjoy the intimacy of archery. Yep. Uh, meaning, I, I like the fact that I have to have the skill to get 50 yards or under. And yeah, and there are some phenomenal crossbows out there. I'm shooting, uh, you know, Mission Archery's crossbow, and they have one now that goes 400 feet per second. Right. Wow. I could probably stretch that to 80 yards. I don't need to. 50 yards is fine. So I like the intimacy of archery. Yep. But I'm also a gun guy at heart. Right. I like a trigger. I like a scope. I am really into precision. I like to split arrows. Hmm. So when I shoot at something, you know, it's not. I want to split a hair, and the accuracy that these crossbows deliver is great. And you know, there's a lot. Of it, if I'm hunting out of a ground blind, I don't have to worry about you know confined spaces and drawing my bow. If it's late season, I got a lot of clothes on. There's not a lot of leaves on the trees. I'm worried about movement, you know. So to me, the crossbow is 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 phenomenal. It's a great way to segue women and kids into the sport. Right. right. And I taught all of my girls the proper way to shoot a firearm by letting them by training them on a crossbow. Interesting. There was no noise. There was no recoil, and it's a whole lot more fun to shoot 3D targets and pop balloons with an arrow. Right. But when I transition them, you know, to an air rifle and then to a 22, now my oldest daughter to a muscle loader, they handle it like a champ because they're used to the general skills it takes to shoot a gun because a crossbow, except for the front end, works like a gun. Gotcha. That's a great answer to a difficult question and you handled it with precision.
precision, knowing that, and you are, you do enjoy the precision. That was a great answer, Greg. I love that. Just awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to take that in consideration, uh, being a father of three young girls myself, and that's a great way to look at it. Very cool. I, there is something about introducing kids to the sport of shooting with a bow. They, they like the fact that when you shoot an arrow, you can see exactly where you hit. Right. I like to use, use lighted knocks for kids because they, it's more yeah. interactive to them. Yeah, for uh, sure. You know, and, and, and you can shoot 3D targets. You know, I put balloons up, and when they get better, I put playing cards up and I play games. Yep. And they you just go to the dollar store and buy playing cards, right? So just randomly, you know, you know, put them up on uh, on a block style target, and then each of my girls gets a shot, and I get a shot, and uh, we play for Jolly Ranchers. That's awesome. So, who, so whoever has the highest card gets a Jolly Rancher. So then we kind of barter and trade, and they got the purple, and I got the green, and I got four, and you got three. But it's fun, yeah. and uh, you know, and, and again, we're, we're teaching you know the kids skills and, and all the general safety precautions that you have to learn both with a firearm and a bow. Right. Great. Greg, are you a competitive person by nature? Do you let your kids win? <laughs> I'm a competitive <laughs> person, absolutely. Yeah, so was... all, all of my kids understand. Um, by the way, I shoot left-handed, uh, you know, to give them an opportunity here. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> uh, but but all of my kids understand winning and losing, and yeah. and that you have to strive to improve. So with, I think you guys know with the sport of, of shooting, um, it's an individualistic sport. Right. So it's not really are you better than somebody else? Are you better today than you were a month ago and tomorrow will you be better than you are today right and so i really try to work with uh with all my kids on progressing their talents and uh and showing them that it's really about continuous improvement in life gotcha that that is uh, a great answer and spoken like a ceo that's awesome <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's true. Well, I mean, you're, you're competitive and you always want to teach your kids to grow and yeah. get better and understand how life really should be. And, um, but there's got to, you must be a bit competitive in a sense outside of the teaching side. I mean, when you're, when you're face to face with a challenge, mm -hmm. you got to have it. Is that you? Yeah, I think I think innately everybody enjoys some form of, of winning, right? Yeah. And uh, and, and and winning is is often defined by by what your own personal goals are. Right. And they could be fitness related, they can be spiritual related, they can be hunting related, they can be work related. But I think everybody has to have something loftier in their life that they're striving for because I think they give you a sense of accomplishment and and really fuels your well being. Right. Absolutely. Greg, you're working on becoming a, a master storyteller. <laughs> How's it going? Well, you know, I, I've, I've been blessed with uh, meeting a lot of great people and uh, being able to lead some really good organizations. And um, and I think uh, what you guys are doing here with the podcast is fantastic. You've got a great collection of uh, talented people in the industry, and you're spreading the word. And uh, I certainly appreciate your contribution to the industry. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. We're having a good time, and we're meeting a lot of extremely interesting people, people that I never thought we would ever meet just being the average hunter watching TV. Uh, Dusty, would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and the things that we're learning, not only for Jay and I, but the listeners and, and everybody that joins in with the Big Buck Registry, you know, that's why we're here. You know, we're talking to Greg Ritz because we want to learn more to take our hunt to the next level. And, and that's what it's all about, trying to spread the information and one hunter to another and, and become a, a community of hunters, no matter if you're a bow hunter, a gun hunter, a pistol hunter you know it doesn't matter let's all join together unite and learn something for everybody as we go absolutely Greg. absolutely well you know guys if i'd love to join you again we should plan something you know, maybe after a uh, hunting season where we can uh you know uh, tell some tall stale tales and relay some stories from uh, the previous month because i think this year the way things are shaping up with uh, the weather patterns and the good rain and the you know, it looks like we're going to have a good harvest year there should be some giant white tails taken this year absolutely yep it's going to be a little different than it, than it has been i think and, ho and hopefully we're not going to be faced with any ehd cases like we like right. we had the last right exactly yeah absolutely and hopefully the the rain keeps that out of the streams and stuff and gets that mm -hmm. gone Greg, I have a few questions from our audience. Do you mind if I run down those real quick with you? Absolutely. Very cool. All right. Uh, let's see. Josh Fox. Uh, why is it every time your show comes on the Outdoor Channel, it's a rerun of him killing the caribou buck? Hmm. <laughs> 
Well, I, I'll, I'll, I'll answer this saying this Monday, yep. June 30th on the Outdoor Channel, uh, the all new episodes of Hunt Masters begin. And, you know, we've, uh, really have refaced the show start to finish completely new. And, uh, we've taken the show a little bit different direction. And I'm really excited for, uh, the fans to be introduced to the new concept this Monday. Can you give, give us some details about the new concepts? Absolutely. So my idea on what Hunt Masters should be, I don't, I don't profess to be a professional. I don't profess to be a hunt master myself, but I am now searching the world for who are the hunt masters. These are the guys, the outfitters, the indigenous people, the local heroes, if you will. And, you know, and it may be in Pennsylvania that I find, you know, some guy in, in Allentown who happens to be the local big buck expert. Or, you know, it might be, uh, you know, an Alouette on the Aleutian Islands hunting reindeer for that species. And, uh, you know, I think to, to tell their story, to introduce people to um, other, call them hunting masters or, or professionals in their own right around the world is, is really what I'm hoping to convey. And then, of course, show people some great, you know, cinematography and some, some beautiful landscape on what all the opportunities that we have to hunt in North America and around the world because we are blessed guys with more hunting opportunities today than our grandfathers were. Absolutely. There's no question about that. And we should take advantage of it as hunters. That's uh, that's so true. Absolutely true. Um, this one's from uh, Stefan Olney. Uh, when late season muzzleloader hunting, what's the best way to get wiry bucks to come into range after a long season? Any tips on that one, Greg? Well, you know, we, we talked, you know, quite a bit on pressure. And by late season muzzleloader, these deer are well educated. There's just no question. And the work that you do preseason is going to determine your success late season. So uh, right now, you know, I have plans to head out, head out to my farms in Illinois uh, last week of July, and I'm going to be putting in my food plots. And these food plots, you know, are going to be planted with oats, winter rot, rye, turnips, clover, and alfalfa. And the reason for that is I am going to utilize that food source late season. I'm not going to hunt them. I'm not going to pressure the deer early season. I'm going to let the deer feel secure and safe and provide them the nutrition when they're when they're rutted down, they're all skin and bones, but I'm going to wait until the temperatures are brutal cold before I hunt these deer. Mm. Because when the deer have to eat, the colder it is, the nastier it is. So, but I'm going to put the work in early. I'm going to put my ground blinds in early because I'm typically late season, not a big tree stand fan just because there's no leaves on the tree and, and a lot of times you get big groups of deer at one time come in. So if I'm trying to kill a mature deer that's been educated all season, I want him to know you're safe here and what's going to drive him to move in the daylight are just brutal temperatures, which means i got to man up during those days and, uh, and sit out there when it's sub-zero. Gotcha. So off limits, keep keep some sanctuary out there for your you got late it. season. Yep. Got it. All right. Uh, one other question from the audience here. Um, how do you make it big time in the hunting industry? This is from Zach Jenkins. You know, I think that might be the number one or number two <laughs> question that I, that I, that I get asked, uh, right. you know, when I do appearances. The, uh, there are a lot of opportunities to participate in this industry. Right. And, uh, and virtually anybody who has a passion to be in this industry can find their following. And that might be working retail, working for a distributor, you know, that might be working for a manufacturer on an assembly line, might be a marketing manager, or, you know, it could be a celebrity, you know, doing, uh, doing a television show. Right. And we're fortunate today to have such an opportunity with social media to create a presence or awareness for ourselves in today's community. Right. You know, we have the ability to post videos on YouTube. We're able to build our own little social communities around our own personal brand. And anybody who aspires to be on television, it's challenging. There are 400 television shows out there and, uh, you know, we're probably overserved with, with programming. But I will tell you that if you're yourself and you're unique in some form or fashion, you can find an opportunity opportunity uh, in this industry on, on the television side. Right. Would you say that, it, that or is it fair to say that it's not going to come pick you. You have to go get it. Is that fair? No, 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 no question. You know, if if you really sat down, and I, and I and I wish this could happen at a Harrisburg or something, and you took a Ralph and Dickey, you took a Mark and Terry Drew, you took a Lee and Tiffany Lakoski, and a Michael Waddell or a Jim Shockey, all of us, right? Right. I Man, I'm on my 17th year doing television. Right. It's a long time. Years. Years. Right. 
and everybody started. You know, Michael Waddell started, you know, as a cameraman at Realtree. You know, Lee and Tiffany Lakonsky, you know, Lee was writing articles for Bow Hunter magazine and working in an archer shop. He was a chemical engineer and he took the gamble to move to Iowa. And of course Tiffany, you know, agreed also and she was a flight attendant to try to, you know, carve out you know, some type of living in, in the industry. Mark and Terry Drew the same way. They started Mad Calls. Jim Schott started as an outdoor writer and, and a guide on Vancouver Island for black bears. Right. I don't think any one of those people ever, if you look back 20, 30 years ago when they started, said, you know what, I'm going to be one, you know, I'm going to be a top celebrity on television today. Right. What they said is, how can I be involved in a sport that I'm so passionate about? And yeah, I need to make a living, but I just want to have fun. Right. And things unfold over time. So I think people, sometimes their, their goals are too lofty for where they are. Um, in their position in life and they need to eat the elephant, if you will, in one bite at a time. And, um, you know, get involved in the industry and get started, but uh, work hard. That That's that's what our industry re- rewards you with. Right. And very, very well said. Absolutely. Yep. Um, I'm, I'm going to jump in, Greg. If you got a quick minute, I'm, yeah. I'm, on, I'm on the story side of the Big Buck Racery. If, if you got time, I want to hear your most memorable, most awesomest whitetail hunt you've ever been on. Can you run us through it? <laughs> Well, I can tell you about a whitetail hunt that was extremely memorable to me, and it did. Uh, it, it resulted in, in, the, in the kill of a nice whitetail, but not the kill uh, of an extraordinary whitetail. And it just so happens that you're going to be able to watch this unfold on television this year. Cool. All right. So I, I, I went to Iowa. You know, I owned some ground with Lynn Tiffany out there, and, and uh, you know, we've, uh, we've worked together to build some of these farms and really manage them well, and, and I was excited, you know, that I... You know, it was finally through a, a, an Iowa bow tag, which takes two or three years. And um, I was going out during the rut. So uh, so anyway, I was hunting in Illinois and, you know, just kind of waiting until the rut was really going to kind of kick in. And it was early November. It was about November 4th, I think, or 5th. And things are really slow in, in Illinois. I mean, like, definitely slow. It's like slack tide. So I knew we were a day or two. And I called Lee up. I said, Lee, what's going on over there? I said, you know, should I just slide over to Iowa? It's an hour and a half away. He said, great. He said, things are kind of slow here. But he said, I think we're a day or two away, so why don't you come on over? Okay. Get in the truck and drive over, trailer the Yamaha, and all excited to get in. And, you know, and of course, you know, anyone who's around Lee knows that, you know, you're going to look through trail camera photos every night. I mean, thousands of them. You know, when you have 8,000 acres that you manage and you have 200 cameras up, there's it, it's a full-time job looking at trail camera pictures, which is fun. So we go through and kind of put a strategy together, get up the next morning, go out to, to go out to the stand. And <laughs> I'm, I'm embarrassed to tell you this. Uh, I had hunted <laughs> yeah, the evening before. Uh, no, I, I was hunted the evening before in, in Illinois. And when we packed up the truck, we left right from the field. And I hitched the Yamaha onto the trailer. I put my bow on the ground and I left it there. <sighs> Uh, oh, so man. Like, you got to be kidding me. So we drive all the way back, right? So I missed that morning time. Drive all the way back. My bow's still sitting on the edge of the road. Thank God, right? Nice Matthews bow. I'm sure somebody would have loved to have that. Sure. Oh, yeah. UAD oh. rest and a HHA site on there. I mean, it was, it was a pack driver. So I get the bow. I'm like, you know what? You know, why don't we, uh, I'm talking to my cameraman at this point, Alex. I said, you know what? Let's go run a couple cameras on the side of the farm. I said, we've blown our, our morning hunt. So we go out. We're standing at a camera. On, on the edge of a, a cornfield in the timber starts, big cedar thicket, and it just erupts with deer. Hmm. So inside of 12 hours, the rut went full tilt. There are bucks chasing does. There are six or seven different bucks. We had a, a big 140-inch 10-point come from behind us as we're watching deer in front of us to run right by. Oh, wow. Like we weren't even standing there. And, of course, I've wow. got my bow now, but guess what? I didn't bring my backpack and my release. Of course. Of course you didn't. <laughs> of course. And, of course, the cameraman <laughs> didn't have his camera. So we, we watched this, and, and we're like, okay, well, let's get back to Iowa. So we got back to Iowa, sat in the tree stand that night, and filmed 260-inch deer. And these could be 165, two big deer, for 15 minutes in a knockdown, drag out fight. Blood coming out, locked horns, flipping each other upside down. We filmed it in high speed. You'll be able to watch it this fall. It is extraordinary. <laughs> I, I can't, uh, but, I can't I wait to awesome see this. Experience. Oh, man. Man. Oh, it was just, and, and to me, what hunting about is the accumulation of all the experiences is not the end, the end result of a great experience in hunting is not death. And if right. you're, if you're, right. if you feel that, that the only success that you get out of a hunt is walking up to a dead animal, you better pick a different sport. Right. It's interesting yes, you say so, that. Yeah. I would. So, so we, we, st- 
filmed that, we watched that, we sat there the next night, the vicar came out, and we're like, oh, this is fantastic, right? And he's walking down the field, he's getting closer, getting closer, and we're filming him. And a three-year-old deer that, I don't know, there's maybe a 130-inch deer, comes out, this deer turns around, hightails it out of there. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. He was a vicar yesterday, now he's running away from a three-year-old. Huh, interesting. So, um, just a couple days later, the weather turns, it's brutal cold, the wind is 30 miles an hour, snow's coming down, and just geez, giant white flakes and we were hunting some standing beans there's a dozen does and fawns out in this bee, in this bean field and we're like you know what the weather conditions are going on something's got to happen and out comes a giant five by six 170 inch deer mm-hmm. and he goes they have a name? every every single doe and fawn and starts checking them no way and and oh it, it's incredible and you wait to see the footage of this because again we shot it in high speed and the snow coming down and and this deer is just magnificent. And uh, so he's checking, and we're filming all of this. And he comes into 20 yards, and he stops like a 3D target and turns his head away from us. And my cameraman goes, I'm on him. Nice. That's and he a, goes, nice words to hear. I'm on him. Kill him. I'm like, no. He goes, we need no. I said, he's, <laughs> he's three years old. And he goes, right. you think if you were really cares? <laughs> right. <laughs> did, did, you know, did the did the camera get beamed over the side of your head when you said no? Yeah, it, 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 exactly. <laughs> oh, trust me, I got the I got the rolled eyes and uh, the the you know the WTF problem. Right. But uh, <laughs> but you know what? It, it's it's the commitment that that I've made and I subscribe to uh, with Lee and Tiffany that we're going to hunt mature deer. And it doesn't matter what the antler size is. It could sure. be a hundred and thirty inch deer, but it has to be in that five and a half year old age class. Right. So we let that deer go, which is heartbreaking. And, uh, and then two days later, last day of the hunt, we're hunting on, uh, you know, uh, a, uh, alfalfa and clover plot, uh, arrow seed, uh, makes it a fantastic mix called full potential. We knew that, okay, now that the snow's gone, temperatures have warmed up, they're going to be back on the green. So we're sitting in this little cedar tree in the corner of this field. And, um, we weren't sitting there long. We saw just like this deer cut the end of the field. And we're like, that was a buck. Was it a good buck? What was it? And it just kind of disappeared. And a few other does came out, but it was really slow, really slow. And we're like, this is the last night of the hunt. And they only get drawn every three years on an Iowa tag. So really kind of at a low point and so uh we're like well you know sun's going down we're down to the last two minutes of light and the cameraman says well why don't we just close the show out here and just tell the viewers hey we had a great hunt and it just wasn't meant to be so the cameraman turns the camera to me and i turn to the camera and start yapping and uh he goes big buck big buck i look at him and i go what and i look over my shoulder just at the end of this field about 120 yards away there's this buck just cut in the corner of the field the same route that that uh we saw another deer go three hours earlier I reached down to my left and I slapped my antlers, the, my rattling antlers. All I do is I just slap and they just tickle themselves together and the deer jerks his head up. Mm. And the cameraman now, he's focused only 120 yards away. I take my hand and I tickle them together. Well, he turns around 180 degrees and starts marching in. Wow. And, you know, this is a, a beautiful 10 pointer, you know, great five and a half year old deer. Oh, yeah. yeah it's a hundred, this is a 150 inch deer. And, uh, we, so I ended up rattling and calling this deer in to 25 yards and shooting with my bow with 30 seconds of light left on the last day of the hunt. Wow. Awesome story. Wow. And, Phenomenal. And again, you know, I didn't want to end with, hey, we killed a great deer. It was all of those experiences of this trip, the highs and the lows and the passes and the buck fight that really made that entire trip trip probably my most memorable way to experience right, right. it's the whole package it's every event that the occurred during yep. those days it's amazing awesome that, that's like hunt, that's hunting that everybody dreams of yeah well yeah. And, and i remember my action i turn back the reaction i turn back to the camera and go what just happened i mean we were literally closing out the show we had i don't want to say given up but we've kind of you know just said that was it but a period at the end of the story and unfortunately uh the story uh, had one more chapter left. That's awesome. I love that. Um, so, Greg, you surrounded yourself with some great people. You, you're a student of others, and you're learning from others. Um, tell us a little bit about Wildcom before we let you go. So, uh, when I um, left Smith & Wesson, I spent a couple of years there, as I told you, as uh, president of the Long Gun Division, and my contract was up in the You know, I enjoy being a entrepreneur. I like to build companies. I like to support people. And living in that environment, which, you know, is very successful, you know, over 3,000 employees in a $600 million company now, yep. I, I'm, I just, I, I like to build things. And I said, you know what, um, we, as an industry, really need somebody from an outdoor marketing 
and media perspective to help represent the talent, start evolving the content of the show so we're just not about killing things. We're about we're storytellers. Right. And to find all the ways to, to activate the industry to promote this great sport. And uh, so I started Wildcom. And, uh, and I'm proud to say we have 13 television shows, some of the top talent in the industry. And we work with, guys, I bet just 300 companies in our industry wow. in some form or fashion. And uh, and that really is, is rewarding to me to feel that I can contribute. And, and my team is really, I guess, say the success of, of Wildcom is my team. It's not me. They do all the hard work. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I think, uh, you know, we contribute in some small way to a lot of people in this industry. And I think we're making a difference. That's awesome. That's very cool. Absolutely. The, uh, when I, when I saw Sean's, and I want to give us a shout out to Sean for setting this up, but it, it was great to see uh, a 603 area code come through. And <laughs> I was like, no way. This is, this is awesome. So I appreciate it. <laughs> well, that. It, it's, it's certainly nice to be on home turf. There's, there's no doubt about that. And, um, you know, Sean's a great example of somebody who uh, who has extraordinary talent, but was really never exposed to the outdoor industry right. um, from a hunting perspective. And now to see her passion to shoot bows and shoot guns and the constant uh, nagging we get in the office of, where am I going? Huh? And uh, so it's nice that we have another advocate for our industry uh, in House of Wildcom. Right. So at Wildcom, you get to hang out with some some pretty cool talent. Um, you have a great team, great staff. You got you hang out with Michael Waddell. And you developed yep. a bone collector. I believe you told a story about uh, shooting at the range, as I recall. And yes, where you coined correct. the term bone collector that day. Um, and hanging out with Willie Robertson as well. Is that correct? That's correct. I mean, really, all the uh, the people in our community, we're all great friends. Yeah. And we're all there to support one another. And so uh, whether it's Jim Shockey, who's hanging off a mountainside in Tibet, or uh, whether it's Willie, you know, crushing some ducks down in Louisiana, we all find times to uh, to share stories. And, and of course, we're, we work a lot of promotions together, and we put a lot of long hours in. But it's um, it's nice to see the reward from, uh, you know, the level of participation we see, you know, from all the people in the industry yeah. now. And the fascinating thing about Willie, and I think you'll agree, is that he is he's a great outdoorsman, but he's also a super sharp businessman oh yeah no no doubt no doubt i mean it's you know willie uh he's uh he has found a unique blend of working hard and and being very successful at business but making it fun right and uh so being around him he's a prankster he's always smiling (laughs) and he's one of these guys that doesn't take himself too seriously Uh, but he um he's always uh you know a hard charging guy and i i respect that because uh, people enjoy being you know being in his presence that's awesome well, Greg, this has absolutely. been an absolute pleasure and an honor to have you on our show. And uh, thanks for just spending an hour with us, just kind of talking deer hunting and some tips on on all kinds of things. And uh, we'd love to have you back again sometime. Well, let's, let's plan it, guys. Like I said, something after season, we'll uh, we'll share some of our stories uh, from the fall. And uh, again, thank you for this opportunity. And uh, you know, good luck uh, with everything that you're doing. And I, and I appreciate your contribution to the industry. Well, that's fantastic. How can we reach you um, to uh, reach? Uh, watch your shows check out you know, the, 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 new the, hunt, the hunt best masters. way to stay in touch with me is through social media you Good. know through uh facebook you know through twitter um you know and now i even have instagram accounts and everything else uh, out there so uh oh my goodness the uh you know to you know we try to put in uh, all the previews for the shows coming up because we have the whole new series as i mentioned starting on monday so uh you know check out the, the facebook and the twitter and um or you can just log on to uh the huntmasters.com website gotcha and uh you know kind of find out uh, what's going on uh, with me on a daily basis. Very cool. Well, we will be watching from afar through the Facebook, social media, um, and I guarantee it we will be sharing lots of your footage on the Big Buck Registry Great. because it's just awesome stuff. We appreciate it, guys, and uh, good luck this fall. Uh, so uh, stay in touch and send me some pictures of some big deer. Absolutely, Greg. Thanks again. Thank you. You know, Dusty, now and then there's you meet individuals in this industry that we talk to on the podcast or at a show or whatever, and they just kind of blow you away. That kind of happened to me tonight. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I'm kind of, I don't want to say I'm speechless, but I'm soaking it all in. There's so much to absorb. That guy knows everything. Yeah, absolutely. He knows everybody. He's a Rolodex. He really is. Of information for the Whitetail Woods. And that, you know, that's what we're digging for to have join us here at the Big Buck Registry, Big Buck Podcast. And that we'll definitely see Greg in the future on the show. And uh, we're going to learn some more. 
yeah, I, I, mean, I could, man, I'd spend hours with that guy just learning from him. I mean, he, yeah. you can tell he spent so much time studying the the mistakes of others and the stories of others and successes of others, not just in the hunting industry, but in the business world too, that if you could, I'd like him to be my mentor. You know, that's, that says a lot. I have a lot of respect for Greg Ritz. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and thank you, Greg, for joining us and for the information that you released to us that, that will definitely, I know that Greg is going to help thousands of hunters that listen to the show take their hunt to the next level. Yeah. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to, I made a lot of notes while we talked to Greg. I know that. If, oh, I got, I got a whole page. I got, I got absolutely. a page and a half, but Man, that was awesome. So, well, thank you to Greg again. It was a great honor to have you on the show. Love to have you back after deer season. Tell some more just awesome stories. Um, and uh, hopefully you won't forget to bring your bow home next time because, man, that's a prize just sitting there waiting for you on the side of the road. So, <laughs> Absolutely. Man. Can you imagine if you're driving down the road and, and there's a bow laying there that belonged to Greg Ritz? I know. But write your name on it, Greg. <laughs> Yeah. Just put your name on it. Yeah, you know, because a rightful hunter would return it to you. Absolutely. And I think most, well, if it were a hunter that picked it up, yes. But there are probably many others that don't even care that would just uh, hawk it somewhere. So you'd probably find it. Like that antler that was uh, stolen out of the, the town office there that, that Ed Wade had talked about. Yeah, definitely. I got an email on that. And, yeah. You know, it, it, that was that was a great story, a great ending. Great story. And we actually, through the Big Buck Registry, and I think you posted it too, um, we actually helped to recover that antler yeah, as, that the, was, as the story was, goes. Yeah, that was cool. You know, right. That, that, no, it was one of the things where it was a group participation and it turned out a great re- end result. Yep. You cannot outrun the passion and the dedication of hunters on social media these days. You just can't do it. So, Greg, if you if you leave your bow out there and somebody takes it, don't worry. We'll get it back. We have a great mechanism. So, that just my two cents worth. So, anyway. Absolutely. Yep. Um, Dusty, uh, how can we reach you over at Chubby Tines Outdoors? Facebook.com forward slash Chubby Tines Outdoors. And, uh, you know, definitely look us up, get in touch with us, shoot us a picture, harvest, trail camera. You know, we always like seeing what is up and coming. The, you know, velvet racks are, are out right now, and uh, we love to see them, you know, and uh, we enjoy it. So, thank you for everybody that sends pictures in. Jay, how can people get in touch with you at the Big Buck Registry? Big Buck Registry. We can see so you can touch base with us at the their general main website. Our blog is bigbuckregistry.com. Uh, if you'd like to submit a picture, we have a great new mechanism over at the Big Buck Registry. We used to get a lot through Facebook, but we were finding that we couldn't really keep up with it and by by means. That, and what I mean by that is we couldn't keep responding because we're getting so many of them because people were forgetting to put what state the harvest was in or they'd send us a picture of just the buck and not them and the buck stuff like that so we made a specialty page at bigbuckregistry.com forward slash my buck you go there all the instructions are right right there waiting for you on how to submit a picture you can upload you can tag a, a photo with a url you enter your name there's a drop down right there for the state and send it in. And if all else fails, there's an email address right there. Open up the email, attach the picture. And again, just don't forget the state because it's super important to us about where these deer are coming from and what's happening in your state and the the health of the herd in that state. That's kind of what this is all about. Um, Granted, you get to be famous for a day because we're going to post it on our our, uh, Facebook page, which now has about 100,000 followers. So you will, people will know about your deer for sure. And then you may get calls from like Field and Stream and uh, Big Buck Magazine. There's all kinds of things, that, great things that happen when people see what you're doing. So, but anyway, bigbuckregistry.com forward slash my buck. If you'd like to leave feedback for the show, 724 724 613 2825 is our phone number. You can text in a photo there, leave us a, give us a call, feedback about the show, questions, whatever you want to do. And uh, if you want to just shoot me an email, if you'd like to be a guest on the show, uh, shoot me an email, j at bigbuckregistry.com. Um, I think that's about it, Dusty. Uh, just an uh, awesome show. Just learned a lot from Greg, and Greg, thank you again. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Greg, and uh, we look forward to talking to you in the future. And uh, thank you for the listeners that's tuning in right now. Absolutely. I'm Jay Scott. And I'm Dusty Phillips. This is the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. See you next week. Can't wait. <laughs>